I'll preach it someday. I'll have to preach without notes. But God said don't preach that one this morning. You say, well, preacher, when did he tell you? Sitting there on the platform on that little short bench. It's difficult to say God told me if you don't hear an audible voice. Praise God. James chapter 1. I'll be preaching without notes now. I may make a mistake or two on my scripture. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll preach something else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Praise God. Revelation. I'll have to find it. Revelation 10. Now I'll begin reading with verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. His face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. He set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth, cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea, upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. You may be seated. directed by the Spirit of God to preach on the mysteries of God is finished this morning. The mystery of God is finished. But in the days, verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared 
to his servants, the prophets. It's difficult this morning for the finite mind to grasp the meaning of it all. Why am I here? I was not asked, I did not ask to be born. Why is there around me all this pain and suffering and neglect and war and death, hunger, starvation, suffering upon the face of the earth? Preacher, if there was a God, why would He allow all of this to go on unchecked if He has all power like you say He has? Why would He allow mankind to suffer as they are suffering? What is going on anyway? And why am I here? These are some of the questions that have been asked to me in my uh, ministry and in my walk with God, and uh, I just suddenly felt it laid upon my heart to explain the mystery of God. Now, we are in the very wind down of time. The Scripture tells us that we are living in the last days. I would not be surprised this afternoon as I lay in my uh, bed to rest for just a little while. Don't you call me this afternoon unless it's an emergency. If it's an emergency, call me any time. But don't call me up just to have conversation. When a man preaches an hour under the anointing, it's like working an eight-hour shift. If I teach an hour and preach an hour, it's like working 16 hours nonstop. I am physically exhausted when I go home. Now, it's not until I stop that I get tired. I feel like I could run a thousand miles right now. I feel like that. But oh, when I finish, it'll hit me and I'll, I'll get limp-legged and, and uh, my strength will run out of me. So don't call me. Let me rest a little while. I've got to find something uh, to preach to you tonight. Praise God. But... Uh, why? I have heard so many times. Preacher, why? Why? And uh, so, I, I'm going to try to draw you a word picture this morning of why things are the way they exist. And to somehow give you an understanding of where we are and where we have been and where we are going. We are living in the end of time, and I would not be surprised, as I started to say, while I am asleep this afternoon, that I would hear a trumpet sound. First Thessalonians 4 and 16. Wife, and read for me. I can quote it, but I'd rather have her read it for you. Then you'll know that it does not come off the top of some fanatic preacher's head but that it is coming out of the divinely inspired Word of God. First Thessalonians, sweet woman, and chapter 4 and verse 16. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with Him. You may read it, dear, if you so desire. For the Lord Himself. For the Lord Himself. Shall descend from heaven with a shout. Shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the with archangel. With the voice of the archangel. And with the trump, and the of, trump God, of God. The dead and the dead Christ in Christ rise shall first. rise first. Then, then we, we which are alive, are alive and, and remain. remain shall be caught, caught up, together up together with them in the clouds, clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so, so shall, we shall we ever be, be with, with him. Now, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We are in the wind down of time. We are living in that time when the Lord Himself is going to come and catch His waiting bride away. He is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. And a young man so expectantly and so uh, so deep uh, uh, in, in anticipation uh, watches that beautiful girl that he is in love with and he dreams about carrying her away to his home to make her his wife. So it is with Christ and the church. Uh, he gave himself for us. He purchased us with his own blood. And in the beauty of holiness, he watches us today ready to catch us away and to fulfill that marriage supper of the Lamb. And we are presently living in the end of all time. But back in the very beginning, it was in the plan of God. You are looking this morning at the plan of God. It has been the plan of God throughout the ages that He would have a blood-washed bride or a blood-washed church to occupy eternity with Him. It has been the plan of God. That is why in my Sunday school lesson, as I have already said, He set the earth in its orbit and scattered the stars in their places and set the sun in its orbit. It was to prepare an earth. And when he had prepared the earth and uh, uh, divided the land from the sea and caused the green grass to grow and created the animals upon the face of the earth, he had one more creation that God planned. Don't ask me why. I cannot tell you that in a celestial being, in a world of beauty, that our finite mind simply cannot comprehend. There is a celestial being that is entirely and completely surrounded by angels worshiping Him day and night and crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And I do not know why God would want carnal, weak man to worship Him. But it has always been in the plan of God that man and woman would lift their hands in adoration and worship unto the eternal God. There is something about God that desires the worship of weak carnal men and women. I do not understand it. I cannot comprehend it. But the world was created for man. Then, in the midst of this creation, God planted a beautiful garden for the man that he had lovingly fashioned and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It was the desire of God. Every evening in the cool of the evening, the Spirit of God walked through the garden and communed with the man and his wife. Now it was the foreknowledge of God that they were going to sin. God knew this. He knew it. But He still created man and the woman. And there was a time that they worshipped Him and communed with Him and talked with Him as a friend. And there was no guilt. And there was no shame. And there was no sin. And they did not hide themselves from God. And there was no fear. And there was no sickness. And there was no death. And there was no sorrow. And there were no tears upon the face of the earth. No one killed anyone. The lion ate grass like an ox, and so it will be in the millennial again. When the lion shall lay down with the lamb and eat grass like an ox, and a little child will play upon the hole of a poisonous viper without fear of any danger or any harm. But there was another sinister being that entered into this. You see, in the heavenly world before God ever created this earth, there were three celestial beings. There was Gabriel the messenger who always came with the message. It was Gabriel that came to the Virgin Mary with the message of the birth of Jesus. It was Gabriel that came 
to John the Baptist's mother and father, Zechariah and Elizabeth, that John was going to be miraculously born of his mother Elizabeth. It was Gabriel that came unto Daniel to talk to him about Daniel's image. Uh, Gabriel has always been the messenger, and Michael has always been the warrior. In Revelation 12 and 7, you'll find that Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and his angels. It was a beautiful place in heaven. Uh, there was uh, uh, Michael a warrior and Gabriel a messenger. And there was Lucifer, son of the morning, who was the most beautiful. But somehow it entered into the heart of Lucifer that he would exalt himself above the throne of God. That he would want everything in heaven to worship him instead of to worship God. And there was a rebellion in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought with Lucifer and his angels. And two-thirds of the angels overcame the one-third. And they were kicked out into the earth, out of the heavens and out of the celestial world, into the earth. Now God created man. Put him in the garden. Put him in paradise. The greatest problem that man had was to walk down through the garden, dress it, keep it. But his greatest, his most momentous decision of the day was simply, which fruit shall I eat? Isn't that a terrific problem? Let's see. I'm getting tired of these bananas. I believe I'll just have an orange. You Yankees say that differently. Someone say orange. Praise God. But it was the same thing. Now, well, after all, it takes a while to peel those oranges. I believe I'll just have an apple. I'll just eat the peeling. I'm getting lazy. <laughs> and you have to peel bananas. I'll just eat an apple. How about a peach? One of those Georgia peaches. <laughs> from Georgia. Anyone here from Georgia? Mmm, Georgia peaches. Now, you think they came from Georgia. They didn't come from Georgia. They came out of the Garden of Eden. But all of a sudden, into the garden came a sinister figure. The Bible said he was the most subtle of all beasts. Treacherous, full of guile, insidious, without mercy. Every intent was malicious and harmful. And he walked up to the woman. Now, here, the woman had become separated from God. She had also become separated from the protective presence of her husband. And that uh, Lucifer, or Satan as he is now known, knew the proper time to approach her when she was not in the presence of God, when she was not around the protective custody of her husband, he came to her. Now the moral of that story is, ladies, hang on to your husband. And stay close to God. Huh? Hang on to me. Hallelujah! She said she was going to. Praise God. I'm going to tell you if she ever leaves me, I'm going to pack my suitcase and go right behind her. And where she stops, I'm going to stop. And when she checks into the motel room, I'll be right behind her. That leather slick. I'll be right there. If she goes into room number 21, I say, here I am, dear. <laughs> room 21. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, he knew when to approach Eve. He knew that she was the weaker vessel. I don't care about the ERA. The army's finding it out. I knew it all the time. Now the army said, now they're going to have certain jobs, but certain ones, mm -hmm. they should have asked me in the first place. I could have told them. It's in the Word of God. The woman is the weaker vessel. 
Why don't they read the book? Now, Satan knew who to come to. And he approached her. Oh, someday I'm going to preach on the spirit of Eve. But not this morning. Not this morning. But he caused Eve to sin. He said, oh, he, he, he was slick. He said, now, hadn't God said you could eat of every tree in the garden? You know, he, he quoted Scripture to her. Almost. You've got to watch some of these theologians today. They'll quote you Scripture and just change a word or two. Ah, oh, the devil quoted Scripture to Jesus on the Mount of Temptation. Ah, oh, he quoted Scripture to Jesus. Now, you've got to watch these fellows. They'll quote Scripture to you. But they'll twist just a word. He said, hadn't God said you could eat of all the trees of the garden? Well, she said, that is everyone except one. He said, the tree in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat of it, and you shall not touch it, lest you die. Oh, he said, you shall not surely die. Just inserted one little word. Not. God said, thou shalt surely die. He said, thou shalt not surely die. And he said that old mean, uh, that old mean, uh, uh, old fashioned, uh, straight laced fanatic God. He, he, he just, now he knows uh, the day you eat of that suddenly you're going to be like he is. And after all, wouldn't you like to be like God? And after all, you're missing out on so much uh, and all of the fun that's going on around you. Well, why don't you just get with the crowd? Why, why don't you just mix in? Well, why don't you get like the rest of them? After all, you're really missing a lot, Eve. Well, his argument really hasn't changed too much today, has it? He changes the Word of God just a little and makes sin look so lucrative and so tempting and so harmless. And so she took of the fruit and gave it to Adam. Immediately guilt. They ran and hid from God. Why would they do that? The day before. They were eagerly waiting for Him to come. Suddenly, they realized they were naked. I asked my wife at the table this morning, you ever dream you were naked? I've dreamed I was out in public just as naked as a jaybird. And I'd get so embarrassed. How many ever dream? Oh, don't. <laughs> Oh, it's horrible. And then I dreamed I was smoking a cigarette. And I... <laughs> that nearly drives me wild. Oh, the devil... He, when you're asleep, your mind's in neutral, friend. The devil can grab it and go with it. It's in neutral. Mmm, he'll do anything to you while you're asleep. Mmm, you better watch him. He, he'll grab your mind when it's in neutral. Mmm. I got to get on with this. Now, suddenly, someone said, Why are clothes so important? Well, the farther you get from God, the more clothes you'll take off. The closer you get to God, the more you'll put on. And the more you'll cover up. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to get on that. Someday I'm going to preach on our identity. Ah, you see a man with a horsehide jacket and a chain drive billfold? What do you think? Horsehide jacket and a chain drive billfold. They got that from a truck driver. I had a chain drive billfold 20 some years ago. But right away you think biker, hippie biker. There is an identity. Your appearance tells your identity. But I'm not going to preach that this morning. I'm going to get back to Eve in the garden. Now, God sought them out. When I get to preaching on the spirit of Eve, Eve thought that she could partake of sin and keep right on enjoying the blessings of God. She really thought that. And neither did Eve believe that God would really bring judgment upon her. 
but he did. The Bible said, be sure that your sin will find you out. And vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And the wages of sin is... So he kicked him out. Put the curse of childbearing upon the woman. Put the curse of work upon the man. Put the curse on the serpent of crawling on his belly in the dust. All three of them are still doing it today. Now, ever since, you hear me now, ever since God separated Himself from man, there has been an emptiness and a longing and a vacuum in the heart of all Mankind. Do you know why? Because God left a special little place down there for Himself to live in. It does not matter. Oh, listen. The enemy used to say to me, try this now. Oh, this will make you happy. If you could just get a hold of this. If you could just try this. And I'd try it and sure enough, Oh, it, it'd give me a little pleasure high. But when I came down, the same old emptiness, the same old disappointment, the same old longing, the same old uncomfortable lost feeling down inside. It's been there. It does not matter how deep you go in sin. It does not matter how wealthy you become. There are millionaires that commit suicide by the dozens. A doctor was getting ready to take cyanide the other day and his wife shot it out of his hand with a 357 and he got it with the other hand and took it anyhow. Why? Wealthy, prosperous. Had the preeminence in the community. But there was an emptiness and a disappointment down in his heart that nothing will ever satisfy except the divine presence of God in your life. Now when man was separated from God, I'm going to jump about 4,000 years. God looked down upon the misery of mankind. He looked down upon the sickness and the heartache and the sorrow and all of the disease and the suffering and the death. And God's mercy and His love rose up to the place where He said, I can't stand this any longer. Mankind is under slavery to the powers of hell. Mankind is under slavery to the demonic spirits of the underworld. Man is under slavery and under bondage to the satanic powers of hell. And he is helpless. He cannot throw them off. He is bound by his lustful habits. He is bound by the desires of his human flesh. But I'm going to put on flesh and I'm going to come down there and I'm going to overcome the devil everywhere I meet him. I'm going to overcome him every time I meet him. And so, the Spirit of God overshadowed the virgin. The Spirit of God entered into the womb of the virgin. The Spirit of God uh, grew himself a fleshly body in the womb of the virgin. He was born into the world as a baby in a manger. He grew into manhood. But then he overcame the satanic powers of hell. Everywhere he met them, he overcame Satan. He met him in the synagogue. Come out of him. Come out of him. He met him at the demoniac of Gadara and said, Legion, come out of him. He opened the blind eyes. He unstopped the deaf ears. He healed the suffering and the sickness and the diseases of mankind. He raised folks from the dead to uh, alleviate the sorrowing of a mother that had watched her child die. Finally, finally, he said... When I'm here in a bodily presence, I'm so inhibited and I'm so limited because it's only 
the places I can walk that I am effective. I cannot be in this body in Galilee and be in China and Africa. But oh, he walked up Calvary's hill and let his blood flow for the sins of a lost and dying world. He let them bury that dead flesh. Oh, you know why? You know why he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was the flesh that cried out when the Spirit of God lifted because God cannot die. And it was when the Spirit of God lifted that the human flesh cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, the Spirit of God lifted and forsook him that the flesh might die upon the cross and his blood might be shed for the sins of a lost and dying world. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He stood off and let them bury that dead body. But the third day, down in the bowels of the earth, He entered into that body again, and it came out of the grave victorious over death and hell and the grave. Now, 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 He walked around for some 40 days, strengthening His disciples. And just before he led them out to the brow of the Mount of Olives, the tour guide said it was right here. Here's where his foot last touched. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether to believe that or not. I know it was the Mount of Olives. The book said it was the Mount of Olives. He led them out there, raised his hands. He said, "You go back to Jerusalem and tarry till you be endued with power from on high." And then suddenly. He lifted and extended bodily up into the clouds. Two angels said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing? That same Jesus that you saw go away is going to come again in like manner. And I just read it to you. He's going to come again in like manner. Oh, she just got done reading it to you. That same Jesus that went away, He's going to come again in like manner. Now, now, they went back to Jerusalem. They didn't know what was going to happen. Oh, they were in the upper room praying and worshiping and glorifying God. And the Bible said, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all of the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled. And they were all filled. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Oh! Now! He came as a Spirit. Now! As a spirit, he went away so he could come back as a spirit, as a spirit, as a spirit. And he's in this room this morning. He's in this place this morning. He's in everybody. He, he, he's in, how many of you have the Holy Ghost? Oh, he's in every one of you that have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He is dwelling within you this morning. Oh, now. Now, the reason He's dwelling within you, the reason He's dwelling within you is to give you that power, that same power, that same power, oh, that same power to overcome the satanic powers of hell. Now, now, this is why you can overcome the fleshly desires. This is why you are able to overcome the satanic powers of hell. Because that same Spirit dwells in you that raised Christ from the dead. To give you that power. To give you the power. Now. I brought you. I brought you down to today. I brought you down to today. Now. Presently, in the midst of a born-again church. Oh, you know why you have to be born again? Because you were born with that Adamic nature. 
You were born with the nature of Adam. You've got to take on the nature of Jesus Christ. That's why you've got to be born again. Of the water and of the Spirit. Of the water and of the Spirit. You've got to repent of your sin. Turn away from the world. Turn away from sin. Be cleansed of your sin. Receive the power of God in your life. And then, now, now, when we meet temptation, when we meet temptation, now, long ago, long ago, the alcohol and the adultery and the tobacco, all that, that's long ago. That's long ago. But now, Jealousy, envy, lack of love, lack of kindness. Not to let a root of bitterness or a root of unbelief spring up in my heart. When the enemy tempts me to feel badly in one of you, I say, well, my Lord, how could I feel badly toward that group of folks? (laughs) I've never seen a more beautiful group of people in my life. What's the matter with you, devil? Get out of here! Mm. Now, we're overcoming until we hear that trumpet sound. Oh, then it said that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if it dwells in your mortal body, it's going to change your mortal body. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, and I'm suddenly, the pull of gravity is going to lose its power over me, and just as Jesus went up into the clouds, I'm going to be caught up into the clouds with Him. The pull of gravity will have no control over this body. I will become weightless, and I'll sail up into the glory world to be with Him. My, my, my. Now, now, the mystery, the mystery of God is finished. And time will be no more. Eternity, time. The mystery of God is finished. Oh, I wish everyone could be born of the water and the Spirit. I wish everyone, but not so, not so. A few select few that by faith can reach out and claim the promises of God. By faith, by faith, to reach out and claim what's in the book. Do you know, do you know what built my faith? I said where it said repent. I saw in there it said repent. I said, what's that? They said have a godly sorrow for your sin. Turn your back on the world. I went down to an old-fashioned altar. I knelt down. I began to tell God how sorry I was. I began to tell Him how much I hated sin. I began to tell Him how much I loved Him. And I stood up from that place. I felt like... I felt like 500 pounds had been lifted from my shoulders. I stood up. Oh, tears! Tears will wash your heart clean on the inside. You shed a few tears of godless sorrow. It's going to wash your heart clean on the inside. You're going to feel so much better. They said, do you want to be baptized? Sure. Sure. Hmm. I threw my lucky strikes away that day. You want to know when it was? June the 8th, 1953. I mean, November the 8th, 1953. You count it out. I guess I've quit. Hmm. I guess I've quit. How many believe I've quit? I believe it too. Praise God. I went down in the water in Jesus' name by faith. Come up out of there with my sins gone. By faith. A few nights later, I walked down to an altar of prayer. Mm, I began to pray and to worship God. 
And I felt the divine presence of God come into my heart and into my life. I felt God take a hold of my tongue and my vocal cords and I began to speak in a heavenly language that I have never learned, that I have never heard before. Now, now, I love to have harlots and drug pushers and drunkards to come. You know what I like to ask them? I like to say, I'm free. I'm 21. I'm six foot tall. And I got the money. I got the money. I know where they sell it. I can walk out of here today and go right where they sell it. I know where they sell it. And if I know where they sell it, the police know where they sell it. I can go get what I want. Today! Now, why don't I do it? Could it be I found something better? Could it be I found a greater happiness in God? Now, now, hang on, I'm getting ready to put it on you now. I've tried your way of living. It didn't bring me happiness. Why don't you try mine? Why don't you try mine? You've never tried what I've got, but I've tried what you're doing. How you like that? You like that? Mm, Come and try what I've got. Get a little bit of what I've got. Ooh. Oh. Hmm? Ah, I gotta quit. Time, time has run out on us. But the mystery of God, the mystery of God. Do you see it now? Do you understand? It's not the will of God for anyone to suffer, it's not the will of God for anyone to die. But it's the penalty of sin that brought it upon mankind. And mankind brought it upon himself. But God has provided a way of escape. Man, I'm... Well... (coughs) I dare you to try it. I dare you to try it. I've seen a lot of miserable backsliders... Go back on God. But I never have yet got one of them to admit that it wasn't true. Some of them will blame the preacher. Some of them blame the church. Some of them really get honest and blame themselves. They're the ones that's really to blame. Some of them just get real honest and say, Well, preacher, it's my fault. I just, I just turned back. But I'm miserable. I'm miserable. I'm miserable. And I know it's true. And someday I'm coming back. Someday. But not all of them do. Not all of them do. I've never got one backslider yet to admit that it wasn't true. Hallelujah. I'm going to turn you loose. Our evangelistic service begins tonight at 7 o'clock. Prayer time at 6.30. Are there any other announcements? Hallelujah. Tonight, we're going to give you an opportunity to come and kneel at this altar. Now, we won't make you. We won't force you. We won't intimidate you. We'll just give you an invitation. And if you don't come, we'll love you anyhow. We'll just say, oh God, talk to them. Oh God, pull them out of the fire. Mm. Prayer time at 6.30. Evangelistic service begins 7 o'clock. Let's all stand.